Hi, good evening. My name is Amy Nykamp. I'm the president of the Sonoma County Now chapter here, and I'd like to introduce you to my um, secretary, Rebecca, who is going to be taking some minutes. Hi. And um, we are uh, missing our treasurer, Elaine Holtz, tonight, but we want to say how pleased we are to have Kirsten Lange here from the NAACP. She's great, um, wonderful speaker. And I'll just read you a little bit about her in case you aren't familiar with her. Um, Kirsten Lange is CEO of KAL Consulting LLC and has dedicated her life to diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a long-term resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, Kirsten prides herself on her work, creating and continuing important dialogues and policies of inclusion in education, government, and law enforcement. She runs KAL Consulting, her inclusivity consulting firm for the North Bay area. In her free time, Kirsten spends her time volunteering with the Sonoma County NAACP branch as president, Save Your Six, Title VI Advocacy, Wine County Young Democrats, Santa Rosa Community Advisory Board, Sonoma County Tourism Board, and the Alumni Association of Mills College and Alumni of Color Committee. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you, Kirsten, take it away. Thank you, Amy. Good evening, everyone. Um, really appreciative to be here with you. Um, I have a little presentation I've shared to make it a bit easier to track um, some of the highlights that I'd like to share with you all. Um, as Amy mentioned, uh, here to share a bit of the work of our branch and of course the intersection of black women and black contributors to history. Um, one of the things that we love to always reference are those who pave the way for the work in which we are doing uh, to date. Um, and how that manifests into our contributions to community. As Amy shared, I am a native of San Diego, um, but I've lived in Santa Rosa for the last 12 years and initially came to the Bay Area to attend Mills College in Oakland, California. I loved it so much. I didn't want to go home, but my family and I are so close. They decided to surprise me with a move up here as well. So it became a full dive into my adulthood in this community. Um, most of my career and what I studied were the intersections of public policy, public education, where the funding comes from, how it gets there. And then of course, pursuing an MPA was to ensure that I understood the fundamentals of governance, um, HR, marketing, and all those pieces that make organizations flow. And so my early career was spent in private independent schools, which allowed me to understand the inner workings of private school education that are not uh, connected to any type of religious entity, um, and more importantly, how they worked to recruit students of color, but not only just bringing them into the school, but really centering on the sense of belonging, which was important for me. Um, and after a long stint in that arena for about seven or eight years, um, I decided to open up my own consultancy which was utilizing my experiences in those schools because while I found myself advocating for students, I started to recognize that I was also having my own uh, experience as a, a younger black woman and as an advocate for equity and belonging really being challenged um, in many ways. In the community here in Sonoma County, I'm deeply invested in being involved uh, so these are the organizations that I do um, volunteer my time with or have in the past, um, rooted in just understanding, of course, how things work. I love to learn. I love to understand how they function, and they have really been guiding lights. Um, as uh, Amy shared, I was a founding member of CLEAN um, and the Iolero Community Advisory Council, which is the Sheriff's Oversight Committee, which helped lead the legislation for uh, measure P. So I'm definitely through and through a policy gal. Um, it makes my heart sing and it definitely drives the work that we do um, in community and in partnership uh, through the NACP branch. 
Historically, we want to. I want to highlight a few women. Um, I won't go through a laundry list because I do want to make sure I leave time for us to have some conversation and discussion. But I want to start us off with Ida B. Wells. So she, in her time, of course, was really well known for as an investigative journalist. She was an educator and she was a huge activist earlier on in the um, civil rights movement. She founded the Alpha Suffrage Club, which really served to uh, organize and identify and and help push to elect women who um, were interested in running for office in Black communities in Chicago. She was one of the founders of the NAACP, but it is very interesting. Unfortunately, our organization does not formally recognize her or her contributions. And so this really brings up this dialogue around the ways in which many Black women, because they were super outspoken for their time, they have often been left out of part of some of the histories of these national organizations or larger movements um, of social change um, as a result of them pushing the status quo. Her um, writing, her um, capturing of history, and her challenging some of the patriarchal notions really did not rub a number of the founders the right way. So while we as thankfully, a female-led organization locally, really celebrate and honor her history. We know that it's captured in many different uh, journalists, journals across the, um, the internet. Uh, we recognize that, unfortunately, the organization has not yet formally recognized her contributions to its founding, but it is because of her vision, her vision, her capture of the essence of what took place, and many of those historical events is why we know what happened at Niagara Falls and and they gathered to create this organization in which we operate today. Ruby Bridges is still alive, but it was her early elementary school journey to uh, head into desegregate her elementary school in Louisiana. Now, there is and has been a movement across the nation and really amplified locally, ironically, to honor her legacy. You may see schools do the Ruby Bridges Walk and get everybody going together. They have their purple t-shirts and banners. What I find quite interesting in that participation is that the, some of those schools are still some of the ones that are harming our Black youth. So at what point do the intersections of honoring the history and reflecting on our practices, our policies, and our behaviors are we performative in, performative in nature or are we intentional in making sure that the students are feeling safe, seen, and that they belong in those educational environments? I'm really firm in the belief that we must not do things um, for the notion or recognition that they be done, but that we practice and have our actions match the, um, the honor and the integrity in which they were stood for. And I, I implore all of us, however we are connected to anyone working in education to really think deeply about how we challenge this safe, the school safety, the, the feeling of belonging and the necessity to both honor and recognize her history of desegregation, but the ways in which that still shows up in some of our current Sonoma County schools. And another instrumental um, person in history is Polly Murray, uh, actively questioning the notions of gender, sex, identity, uh, really early on for his time and really recognizing the pushback and the barriers as a result of having a really progressive conversation that was not yet uh, heard of. Um, active writer, active contributor to a number of journals and projects across the country, and also a huge contribution to um, writings that took place through the NAACP. One of the key things, though, was due to these differences and progressive notion of uh, the intersection of identity, gender, and sex, there was pushback from the NACP due to its, you know, really rooted history in um, Christianity, which became a problem for their ability to have the national recognition and publicity. Um, for those who are unaware, we gather in convention annually every year. And that was the place that was made abundantly clear that Polly's activism and conversations were not welcome. And I think that really shaped their ability to maneuver in such a powerful, strong front. Um, but it was to their benefit in having utilized the platform to develop really deep friendships with, um, at the time, Eleanor Roosevelt, and also with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and really was instrumental in the formation of Title IX laws and really pushing for the formation of board versus 
Texas, Brown versus Board of Education, excuse me, and, you know, instrumental in how we continue to push in our work as an organization to ensure that rights are um, acknowledged and, and attained and really upheld through some of these systems that are unfortunately being challenged um, and dismantled as we're seeing through our court system. Mary Ellen Pleasant is also a huge figure in some of the work. Oh, no, go back. Oh, sorry. Uh-huh. Okay, great. So Mary Ellen Pleasant was an instrumental figure in the abolitionist movement in um, the Bay Area after making her way into this region. Um, she was described mostly as a, a housekeeper and um, worked for some of the prominent um, merchants in the San Francisco a Bay Area, but she also was a very strategic uh, real estate agent, um, if you will, for her time, and really really utilizing the wealth that she accrued from working for some of those in the upper F echelon to build, um, build out properties and purchase properties and really address the racism that she was seeing in community. Uh, for those who are familiar with Beltane Ranch, that is the historical land in which she owned in Sonoma County and really built out a safe space for Black folks to have community and congregation together um, for her time. And although the ranch has manifested into something very different, I think it is important to honor that legacy and we are uh, awaiting for them to, to do so as well. There are, of course, many, many more instrumental figures that I invite if you've not yet already um, in Black culture and community that we know and that are talked about often, um, but are also recognized, you know, through a simple search on the internet. I do want to highlight, though, an opportunity to learn more about local contributions. If you've not yet um, vi viewed the Multicultural Roots Project through the city of Santa Rosa, that historical project uh, trails through the stories of so many contributions of individuals across the age spectrum, um, across backgrounds, culture, identity, and really dives into um, how they've contributed to building out, not just for Santa Rosa uh, as a city and as its growth, but their contributions to the county at large. Um, and Amy, I can send you a live link if you'd like to send out to the members following. Um, but it is definitely one that I invite folks to continue their research on. Um, as a policy person, history is a slight nod in my in my tool belt, but not my full uh, ex expertise. And I want to move us into talking about how those founding folks are really instrumental into the work that we do with the NAACP. Um, our vision for the first time has changed in a number of decades, and that is to envision an inclusive community rooted in liberation, where all persons can exercise their civil rights and human rights without discrimination. We're committed to the tool world without racism, where Black people can enjoy equitable opportunities and thriving communities. This simply means we want to exist without being monitored. We don't want someone calling on us for bird watching. We don't want someone calling on us for barbecuing in a park. We want some. We want folks to join us in those endeavors. We want folks to dance with us in the department store when that real good song hits that beat, and we feel it. We want to do that collectively together, and we want to normalize that our culture of of village and and collectivity is is normal for all of us to endure. It's better in the world when you've got everyone near you you know, literally dancing to the beat of the same drum or somewhere in between, rather than, you know, creating some of these narratives we're seeing at large that are a little bit more complex to, na to navigate. Our theme this year set by the national office is for culture and for community, reminding us that our roots around who we are, what we bring to the table, and that our communities are where those opportunities can thrive and live out loud um, collectively together. I touched a little bit on our history, but for those who are um, still learning more about the organization, a collective of leaders from both Black and Jewish communities helped found the NAACP. Both were fed up with the anti-Semitism of the time and the anti and the lynchings and racism that was taking place against Black folks. So they came together to form what we now have um, as, as the NAACP. And what is beautiful is that initially started with 
one to two branches, a couple of regional offices. Now there are over 2,500 branches across the United States. And so when we're at convention together, we're talking six, seven, 8,000 people who've traveled to not only fellowship, but to partake in what is our largest uh, policy making platform of the organization. We have a very robust and long and thorough uh, resolutions process. Um, I've now been keeping a ticker tape uh, the first year I went um, was on Zoom, so it was about two hours, moderated swiftly, because we had, you know, you can vote on your screen, and since we returned in person, uh, that first year in person was four hours, the year after six hours, and last year was 10 hours. So I think we were all very thorough in our feedback that we'd love to be a little bit more expedited in time, just so that we can do all the other fun things that happen during that point of convention, one of which is honoring and acknowledging our civil rights icons. There are a number of opportunities where the work of Thurgood Marshall is celebrated and acknowledged. Rosa Parks and the other women who uh, boycott, who led in the Montgomery boycott um, movement are celebrated through some of the art exhibits and some of our, the youth work. And Megger Evers, who I definitely love to pay honor and respect to for literally giving his life to ensure we had the right to vote. His family um, holds and gives an award annually uh, to a civil rights leader from across the nation for their efforts to do very similar work and ensuring voters' rights are um, acknowledged and, and honored. And so um, his either one of his children or his grandchildren um, or siblings will come to the award ceremony or to the formal session and present the award in his honor. And I, I've had the, the opportunity to hear their firsthand accounts of what that impact was of that one evening where they were looking forward to his return and, and things turned a little bit differently. Um, one thing that I appreciate about this organization is that it honors the history, it challenges the things that may not have always been spoken up. And I look forward to seeing what we continue to do in this next year's uh, session. Now our local branch in Sonoma County was founded in 1953. So 71 years of local activism and pushing against the status quo in community. Uh, the branch was founded by Platt Williams and Allison Gilbert Gray. Now, when these families moved to the greater Bay Area and then transitioned up to Sonoma County, they weren't just moving one household to another. They were they moved in what we call the village, right? So their siblings, their parents, their children, their nieces and nephews. So they came as a whole into Sonoma County. And unfortunately, we're very much confronted with um racism, especially in racism and access to housing. Um, a leader of the San Francisco branch, his home was burned down in 54 by a member of the KKK, sort of as a early warning of this is what you all are getting yourselves into by being a part of this community. And it really became a catalyst into the organization's push for change in Sonoma County, launching what we know is the classic um, steps towards activism and, and nonviolent protest with sit-ins and mobilizing folks to really take a stand against some of the mistreatment that they were experiencing. Um, and that's what you see in some of these pictures up here. Down below, um, Eddie, Eddie Mae Sloan was a founder of Operation Grassroots, which is now uh, fully formed into what we know as Community Action Partnership. But that Operation Grassroots was really set out to organize all of the young folks and young adults who were struggling to obtain access to employment, uh, resume workshops, interview preparation. And when you get the job, if you get the job, how do you manage your money? How do you invest in yourself? How do you save to pay for a place to live and buy your groceries? And really helping to lay a foundation because it was noted that those things were not being provided inherently to those young folks that as they were trying to already navigate the, the barriers into entry. Uh, she and um, among many other women in community were very instrumental in founding on the Commission of Human Rights, uh, mostly set out to address the issues of, of discrimination that Black residents were experiencing, and the Commission on the Status of Women, same cause, different group, and yet when they advocated to ensure Black women and Black community members were included on those commissions because they were not initially in the 70s, uh, they all experienced a retaliation retaliation from their employers. And so really marking the start of some of the difficulty of trying to uh, build the table for which you need to sit at to make decisions and be a part of community. And yet 
when you pushed too hard, it was weaponized against you and really wanting to um, change that narrative for sure. To this day, the work that we do through NACP is in these key bucket areas. Now it's not limited to these things, but these are the charges from the national organization. This, when we're, as I mentioned, the policy session that we participate in, these are the areas in which we are designing and des designating national policy to do together. Locally, or I should say statewide, um, California, Hawaii work together as a state branch collectively. So then we look at within the two states, how we create policy that addresses these areas, all really centered and making sure that there are minimal to no barriers for folks to have access to do the, the bare minimum, exist, again, live in joy and have uh, sustainability to do so. So what we often see, especially in economic stability, a lot of our work was making sure that we were prepared and advocating uh, for um, policy engagement with the American Rescue Plan dollars and making sure that we had the opportunity to um, have access to develop, co-develop programming and um, support with everyone. And that really made um, a huge difference for a lot of our branches addressing educational needs, uh, TK through 12, and access to higher education in, um, in our communities. And more importantly, to uh, address health, well-being, a criminal justice system, voting rights, making sure we have access to voting. Um, I know this is Northern California. Sonoma County is, you know, designated as a quite, you know, progressive area, but we did notice in the last election cycle, not this primary, but the previous, that there were some mis misleadings uh, when folks were trying to return their ballots. We had a lot of folks in South County who were told that if you leave your you know, ballot at the postal office, that it would be counted to only find that that was not true. And what we discovered after some pretty thorough investigation is our mail leaves the county at about 2 o'clock, 2.30. And so the last truck leaves Petaluma to go to San Francisco in and around that window. So if you take a mail-in ballot to the McDowell Post Office at 3 o'clock, it's not going to be postmarked until the next day. And so we worked really hard to inform our community members to be mindful, don't go to the post office, go to the drop box if the voter you know, registrar's office is too far away from you. Um, yes, it is the responsibility of the postmaster to call and make that arrangement, but we noticed that it hadn't been happening. And most voters of color who work a full-time job missed the opportunity to have their vote counted in a pretty key election. And so so that's really where we spend a lot of our time making sure that folks are informed and when we notice things taking place, trying our best to address them. The other piece that really comes up is in the educational atmosphere. A lot of youth have expressed um, experiencing an onslaught of racial slurs, not just from their white peers, but from their peers of color and really finding that they're not experiencing the support that they need from their teachers and from their administrators to address the issue head on. Many are uncomfortable with addressing it. And I've heard in the last couple of weeks, a few administrators telling students to, quote, choose another word. Well, there's nothing worse than the N-word. So there shouldn't be a choosing another word. It should be, this is not language we tolerate on our campus. So we do work a ton with superintendents and administrators to try to co coach them up. Um, surprisingly, to give them the courage that they need to address these issues, as it does have a negative impact on the belonging of, stu of Black students on their campus. And really, this policing of proximity to Blackness that um, seems to be an expectation of their peers and isn't fair and doesn't provide for a positive learning environment. So we really work to support our students, parents and families, caregivers alike, and the institutions to really think about how these things come about in the classroom um, and recognizing how it shows up. While I recognize that to some, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and Mice and Men are you know, seen as classic literature, it's really harmful in a classroom where there may be one black student and everybody is looking for that one pass to say that word. And because it's a read aloud, they're utilizing that opportunity to cause more harm. And while it seems unworldly, this is what our Black students are reporting to us is what makes them feel so uncomfortable to be at school. Because then a few that have expressed that discomfort with the literature to their teachers, they unfortunately were reprimanded and some were suspended for school for defiance. So when we think about how these systems are not set up to support our youth, 
and it 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 is egregious in nature it is the reality that they are dealing with right here and now in 2024 right here and now in sonoma county throughout all of our schools and we're really working hard to try to work in partnership with districts through SCO and through other worldly connections to make that happen, but it is not, it is the unwillingness to address how it is happening in the processes and the discomfort of not wanting to disrupt those things. And more importantly, it seems like the further we are away from 2022 or 2020, excuse me, where we all had to watch what happened to George Floyd, that folks are finding ways to justify their discomfort. But what we are seeing in the data is that our Black students are continuing to be harmed. So this image you see at the bottom that's calling for an emergency, it's highlighting the data from the 2021 portrait of Sonoma. I will mention that prior to our branch advocacy, Black and Indigenous folks were not included in this data set. So for a number of years, the county was priding itself on how wonderful it is to be here, how wonderful it is to live here, but no one was really taking a look at those that were not highlighted in it. And it's because the data was bad. Our Black student enrollment has dropped a few points from 69.3% to now at about 64%, uh, also reflecting in some of the lower educational attainment across the county. And one key thing that comes up from the Youth Truth data, which is a countywide survey made available, but only about 10 districts participate in it, is this key little factor at the second data point here, which is that 29% of elementary school students, 69% of middle school students, and 73% of high school students who identify as Black do not have a strong or supportive relationship with their teachers. So this means these students, where they spend about 80% of their day, are in a place that does not feel comfortable, they don't feel like they're connecting with other folks, and folks are not intentionally thinking about the ways that they can amplify them. So again, we're trying our best to work in partnership with students, their families and caregivers and our educators to really heighten the awareness. It is not to say that everyone intends to mean harm, but the um, consequences of not recognizing this population of students that are often overlooked, it has a greater impact. And when we think about when our elected officials and when our law enforcement or fire and, and public offices are saying, we need more diversity, we need more folks of color, if we're not even matriculating them through our education systems, we've done a disservice to them as a whole. And lastly, of course, we always welcome folks to participate um, in our events. Um, we are, we've worked really hard to try and make them as, as free and low cost as possible so that that is not a barrier to participation as it is often used against our ability to participate. Um, all registration is available from our branch website, uh, but tomorrow night we're doing a screening of The Right to Read, which is a docu-series that follows what who is now the Oakland NAC branch. NAACP branch's second pre second vice president, who's also an educator and activist, and noticed that the students in his classes were not able to read. It follows the stories of two families who discover their children are not reading at grade level. And what we have learned in Sonoma County is that most of our students are illiterate. Uh, most of our Black and Indigenous students are reading far below grade level in the 50th percentile, um, at a 50% rate, excuse me, and it's alarming. And so we are providing the screening for any and everyone who'd love to come and both uh, learn, listen, and speak collaboratively with, with Mr. Kareem Weaver uh, while he and some of the members from the Oakland branch will join us. It'll be at Luther Burbank, it's free, um, and an opportunity to collectively, as we are attempting to model what it looks like for everyone to engage in this work. Uh, the space race, um, is also going to be screened in a double feature on Saturday at the Hillsburg Alexander Family Film Studios, um, in addition to Origin. So if you read that book, Cast, that was a popular feature in 2021 and 2020, uh, this is the film adaptation of that. And that'll be on Saturday. You do not have to stay for both, but we welcome you if you'd like to. Um, we are also, because health and understanding the experience of Black birthing people in the county is still underway. We don't have data, the proper data, the amount of data that we need. Um, and as in partnership uh, with First Five, the Sonoma County Health, Sutter, and a Mother's Care Group, and a few other doulas that work between Solano, Sonoma, and Marin counties, bringing together this feature of birthing justice. So there will be a screening 
food provided, and more importantly, a panel discussion. One of my former professors from Mills who helped write Birth and Justice and its subsequent work, in addition to uh, local uh, OBGYN and uh, birthing folks will be sharing their journeys and highlighting some of their experiences. And in April, co-facilitated by, by our second vice president, we will be bringing out a couple of youth that we've worked with over the years that live in Oklahoma. Um, if you remember a few years ago, there were young people in Oklahoma who were disciplined um, pretty egregiously for wearing their head wraps at school. And uh, they are here gonna come out and visit us and visit Sonoma County and more importantly, share their journey through youth activism for social change and how they really turned their town upside down, pursuing justice and the you know right to be who they are and live out loud and share what that has been like for them. Um, and navigating so many different systems as a result of some of the carceral punishment that came as, as a, a factor um, from that engagement. And that'll be on April 23rd at the Sonoma County Office of Education. Um, and again, we, we welcome you know, all folks to engage. Um, this is how you can stay in touch with me. Um, I, by day, of course, are a DEI consultant. So that's where my work lives. Um, I love volleyball, so that's my fun little add <laughs> uh, to the end of the presentation. Um, and I'm certainly happy to take questions if they are, there are any or any thoughts that come forward for folks. Um, I see a question there uh, from Dana. What does Black student enrollment at 64% mean? Surely not 64% of Sonoma County students are Black. Does it mean 64% of all Black people who are of an age to be in school are enrolled? It means that students who are identified as Black and of, of the total, what would be an estimate of 100%, 64% are enrolled in schools. And so the other challenge that we do have is that at some schools, when administrators are entering their data and systems, they are um, making the designation of either, especially for students who are multicultural or biracial, they are unfortunately marking them as other or as white. And so even at that 64%, it could be higher, but because the data is not accurately being captured and put together, it is why we don't know where the other students are. And there's no direct correlation between those that are in juvenile hall or those that are participating, um, not participating, excuse me, but those that are navigating the um, the foster care system. Wow. Uh, here's Dana's other question. Is illiterate being, is the word illiterate being used to mean, quote, non-literate? The students cannot read and they're not reading at grade level. So we know of and have seen students who are in grades 9, 10, and 11 who are reading at first and second grade levels. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I see here. Anyone else has some questions you want to put in the chat? I also just allowed you all to unmute yourself. So if you wish to raise your hand and be called upon, you can do that. And thank you, Kirsten, very much for your presentation. Um, I do have uh, one thing to say. I'm glad you brought up um, Dr. Polly Murray's. Um, uh, she helped found NOW yes. as well as being involved, of course, in the NAACP. And um, she has a quarter for the US government produced a quarter with her on the back of it um, this year. So yes, look for that. I did capture one recently. So it's in my special jar of coins. <laughs> ah, that's good. And Ida, Ida Wells also had, had one, I believe last year. Yes. So you can just, you, the quarters just pop up and change. You don't have to like order them or something. I got mine and change from a Safeway recently. Okay. And you can order them. Yeah. Um, Kirsten, I wanted to ask more about the, um, 
the event that you have in Oakland, an education event that's happening on uh, the 22nd. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, yes. So I can send you that link, Amy, so you can circulate it. Um, but at Mills on March 22nd, they're doing a full day symposium honoring uh, the work and history of Bell Hooks and the intersection of other writers who are amplifying histories of folks like Angela Davis and a few others from civil rights and social movements. Uh, what's nice is you don't have to drive to campus if you don't want to. It'll definitely be uh, available to folk, for folks to join on Zoom. So if you'd like to stream in and view virtually um, an opportunity to engage deeply, uh, this event started uh, through the School of um, Education um, in a pocket of folks who were developing it for ethnic studies, but of course now with the merger of Northeastern and Mills and Northeastern having an Africana Studies Department, it is now taking a whole new um, umbrella uh, and made available to folks to join, um, again, both virtually or in person. It's from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., so it's a full day symposium. Um, I am looking forward to attending. I'm not sure which modality I will do either, but I think it'll be a really great opportunity to just learn more. Um, again, as someone who seeks extended learning opportunities and engagement, um, this is definitely one that I'm going to make a, make myself available for. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. So <laughs> yes. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say? Meryl? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that Angela Davis is going to be speaking at City Arts and Lectures on Wednesday, March uh, 20th. It doesn't, you know, that's not too far away, but mm -hmm. um, I just thought I'd point that out to people. I think it should be very interesting. Yes. Well, one of the people we have on this um uh, participating in this call is uh, Camarina S. Davidson, who is the president of the California Now. And uh, I'm very happy that she was able to make it because of um, this intersectionality that there is um, between Now and, and, and AACP, especially in the founders. Yes. Yes. And I think it really models the ways in which locally we've continue to have conversation about how we can collectively work together and and really model that moving forward. Because I don't think a lot of people are aware of those connections that exist. Yeah, and I know it's been uh, a long time coming since we had um, a really good, solid group of diverse people, yes. <laughs> especially here in Sonoma <laughs> County. <laughs> yes. So um is there anyone else that wishes to raise their hand or be I, recognized I, I didn't raise my hand this is Camarina oh hi but I do I, I do uh have a couple of questions well not questions really comments you know I appreciate you having this information it's it's very informative um so I appreciate you doing this and I appreciate that you go and do this in many other groups because I think that's really important because when I talk to a lot of uh, now activists, they always say, well, how do I, you know, especially the section where you're talking about how to uh, combat anti-racism, that was really good. And I was wondering if like you were going to make that available for us um, because I think that's like really the type of things that people are, are looking. I think that this histor the historical aspects I really love because I also enjoyed the historical, uh, just the history of it and like things that you didn't know about like all these people that did these amazing things. Uh, and we just didn't know because of who, you know, who writes the books and all of that. So that was my question. And, you know, I'm also interested in what's happening in Santa Rosa specifically in Sonoma County, because, you know, we're, we are, uh, California now is hosting their conference in August in Sonoma County, in Santa Rosa. So we're still building our program in terms of that. I know we've gotten some submissions in terms of people doing proposals for, uh, to present at our one day conference. 
So I'm excited for that. So it's it's really good to get to know that information and you know the organizations that are there in that county. I don't typically share my slides, um, but I can pull together. Um, I have a document that highlights just those two key areas around right. mm -hmm. um, identifying anti-racism and like how to begin the steps forward and some conversation starters, which I can share with Amy um, also as a follow-up. Thank um, you. Think, you know, if there is interest, you know, more instruction on how to participate in the conference, I think our team would welcome the opportunity to share um, a lot of the different work that we do Um not just in the county, but, you know, the way in which we met those youth that are coming out from Oklahoma. Uh, Demetra Smith is on the call too, um, but she helped co-found an organization called Save Your Six and that Title VI intersection of advocacy and education and understanding, helping young folks and families understand their rights through education has definitely been a fundamental uh, catalyst for us to create change in the county. Thank you very much again, Kirsten. We're so happy that you could come. Um, it, I am especially pleased because I love being on the executive board with you um, and your leadership is, you're so dynamic and you're so engaged in what the community does um, that uh, I can only learn more from you as I am. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I don't have anything more to to add. Um, and if we have no more questions, then I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And um, uh, yes, thank you, Cameria. Um, and we can all go and finish our dinners. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for having me. I really appreciated the opportunity to share and highlight what we're up to. And um, as Amy has probably shared some of the programming we're doing, um, you can all, so long as it's, you know, we can keep things free and open, everyone is welcome to attend. Yeah, and I do wanna say that anything that, that Kristen sends to me, I will send out in a newsletter to our members and to um, national, I mean, to, to California State now. Um, and I hope you'll join us for our next meeting, which will be on the, the third Monday of each month. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what we're doing at this point for, for that month. We don't have it yet decided, but we will hold a meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> hope you all can make it. And thank you very much again for, for coming tonight. Thank you. <laughs>